Thank you all for coming. I am so honored to see all of you here today. This is actually one of the happiest days of my life, not because I'm leaving, but because I'm surrounded by people that I admire and care for. A bow to those who have traveled hundreds of miles to be here. You've already met Stephen Bond, president of the Leroy Neiman Foundation from Chicago. Jeff Lindbergh, uh, conductor of the Chicago Jazz Orchestra from Indianapolis. My homie since age three, Charles Bance and his wife, Sandra Petronio. <laughs> from Connecticut, Jim Stodronsky. Uh, my high school pal, his wife, Nancy McMillan. My sister, Ann Nelson from Kansas City. And from Iowa City came my sister, Cannon, and I'm just so happy and grateful to see all of you. How do I feel about making the change that today marks? Lots of emotions, but there are three primary ones. Number three, sorrow that I won't see your smiling faces as often. Number two, excitement about the possibilities ahead. And number one, profound, profound gratitude. My parents were teachers, and I growing up deeply admiring the profession of education, and to be simultaneously, as we curators here are, an educator, a preservationist, and a public servant, that's a noble mission. To do that for 32 years is not a dream job, it's a dream call. And it's profoundly, profoundly In a museum, almost nothing is a solo act. And Virtually everything I've done has been part of a team, that one A team after another. To work with so many dedicated, knowledgeable, and gifted colleagues from inside the Smithsonian and outside. To combine one's passion with one's profession. To make some little difference in how our country values its musical heritage. To get to know personally through the collections, one musical genius after another and to collect the material culture of Duke Ellington and Ella Fitzgerald and Ray Charles for the ages, because we are in the forever business. This, these are the surpassing privileges of my life. A few memories. In 1985, I wrote to Dizzy Gillespie to ask him if he would consider donating his famous, iconic bent trumpet to the museum and didn't hear anything. A few months later, I asked someone who knew him what to do, and he said, get his wife, the rain. <laughs> so I wrote essentially the same letter to her and figured, nah, I wouldn't hear anything. Three days after mailing the letter, a great big UPS box arrived, <laughs> and his trumpet was inside. She wanted it out of the house. <laughs> Several months later, Dizzy himself came to the museum to do a press conference, and it was packed. There were 20 or more television crews and reporters, and a tall British reporter said, Mr. Gillespie, 500 years from now, what will that trumpet be saying? Gillespie looked at him and said, 500 years from now, that trumpet ain't going to be saying nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but I respectfully disagree. That trumpet's going to be saying stories for centuries to come, and this museum will make it happen. In 2001, Lionel Hampton came to this museum to donate his vibraphone. He was such a distinguished artist that at the press event, I introduced him as the Vibes President of the United States. <laughs> he said memorably, when you get to the Smithsonian, you are the best. There is nothing better. After the ceremony, I invited him to take a private tour of some of our wonderful collections, and he looked at me and said, very slowly, painfully slowly. He was 93 and had three strokes. He said, I'm not interested much slower than this. <laughs> and Duke Ellington, I'm interested in Lionel yeah. <laughs> In 2003, Artie Shaw then in his 90s, agreed to donate his two clarinets, and he was in terrible health. Terrible, but he was all there mentally at the press event. He said, people ask me, what's the difference between you and Benny Goodman? You know, two white, Jewish, swing era, clarinetists, band leaders, celebrities, competitors. 
what's the difference between you and Penny Green? He taps his chest and says, I'm alive. <laughs> Making the decision to retire was not easy. We believe deeply in our mission and there is much, much more to be done. So why retire now? Two reasons. Last fall I got married and I want to spend more time with the woman I've been waiting for all my life. My best friend. The other reason, my mother used to tell me, John, always leave them wanting more. <laughs> or as my friend Peter Jacob and Gary Sturm would say, you want to be gone but not forgotten, instead of forgotten but not gone. <laughs> what comes next? Well, I'm going to finish up the deposition of my papers to Smithsonian Archives. Sonia and I will take a honeymoon this fall to Spain, Portugal, and Morocco. And um, I'd like to continue to be an advocate for something I believe in very strongly, which is the Pan-Institutional Initiative, Smithsonian Music. Did you know that with all the Smithsonian's musical resources together, we'd be the world's largest museum of music? My aspiration is to never retire, but rather rewire. <laughs> Retirement? No, rewirement. By that I mean refresh a sense of purpose. I'd like to think I have some more to contribute, and already I feel creative juices flowing anew towards writing, lecturing, and consulting. It's been said that only some of the Smithsonian's valuables are on display or in storage. The rest are walking around in staff. <laughs> it's been the joy and privilege of my life to work with so many treasures filling this room, treasures from within the Smithsonian and without the Smithsonian. And I will treasure our associations forever. Thank you, thank you for your intellectual stimulation, your friendship, and your many, many kindnesses. To quote one of my heroes, Duke Ellington, I do love you. Yeah. <laughs>